From Eric's presentation, you heard two things, two things that may be at a little bit of, of odds from each other. This idea of simplicity versus complexity. The idea of building the simplest user interface you can possibly support in order to ensure that the most complex details in your model are resolved with high, high precision and high fidelity. So before we get started with the guys who are actually doing the real work, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Can I see a show of hands? Who believes that BIM is awesome? How we doing? Seriously, come on, vote. You can vote twice if you want. It's all good. A lot of people think BIM is We also, at Brixis, we believe that BIM is awesome. Now let me ask you one more question. Oh, Mark, thank you. Now, one more. How many of you think that BIM is too hard? Think about, oh, I see a lot of the same hands. That's really interesting. Because BIM is awesome. The concept of building information modeling is amazing. The idea of building a virtual model of your building and running that through its life cycle on your desktop is amazing. But the idea of building a high fidelity BIM is it's generally just too much work. Well, we have something for all of you. And you're going to really love this, because who doesn't love Exploding pumpkins. The top BIM myths. Let's talk about the four top BIM myths. Number one, BIM is just hype. A hype, hype, I think hype, you don't need the A. Anyway, think about this. BIM is not hype. BIM is the future of the AEC industry. It's just taken a while to get there. And conventional BIM, which you'll hear more about, is not always a path for existing users who are migrating from, from hybrid design environments with 2D and 3D to a full BIM environment. BIM will just cost more. That's only true if you buy conventional BIM, not if you buy ours. BIM is just for the big guys. In this demo, this team is going to show you three different BIM scenarios. A residential building, a mid-sized tower, and a full-on skyscraper. And they're going to show you how BricsCAD BIM handles all of those very elegantly in DWG. And then finally, BIM is just too much work. Oops, I'm looking at the preview. Sorry, I guess I can't work on Macintosh. BIM is just too much work. Well, it's too much work in the conventional environment where every single composition needs to be adjusted. Imagine if the machine can assist you in learning what you're doing and helping you raise the fidelity of your BIM consistently across the entire model. And with that, I think I'm going to bring these guys up to show you how BricsCAD BIM really makes a difference. It is the next generation of BIM. With that, guys, show them how we start in 3D, stay in 3D, create 2D drawings and, and uh, construction documentation all in D. WG, high fidelity through AI, visual control, the idea of actually being able to see things in the 3D model that allow you to make design decisions. What a concept. Not something you would normally encounter in a conventional BIM environment. And then the ability to go faster to design documentation, all in the DWG file format. With that, Kevin, please. Take this mic before I mess something up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Don. OK. My apologies. I know. It's hard. It's hard. My name is Kevin Suttlemeyer. I'm an architect and an engineer. And I've also been around the BIM block a few times. I started being exposed to BIM when I was first in architectural practice. Then I got involved with a little company called Charles River Software that then became Revit Technology Corporation that then became Autodesk Revit. Uh, I also do a lot of work with how to leverage data in BIM and also energy analysis as well. Um, so I'm excited to be here today and happy to join you and show you version 19 for BricsCAD BIM. I'm joined on stage by Jakob, which you'll hear in my American accent, calling him Jacob. Um, but Jacob is a BIM product specialist. I like to call him the workflow guru. And I would also like to call up Cherk, 
who is the head of research and development and also artificial intelligence at BricsCAD BIM. We've called this, uh, we've nicknamed this segment Design with a Twist. Uh, we're going to show you how you can go from beginning to end on small, medium, and large projects. So as Don said, there's something for everyone. In section one, we'll go from a blank screen to developing the concept design and exploring design ideas pretty quickly. We'll start to add data to the model, and then we'll show how artificial intelligence can be leveraged to expand that even further. In the second section, we'll step to medium, where we'll show you how you can do your design documentation on a medium-sized adaptive reuse building. And in section three, we'll go to large, where we'll look at how you can deal with large complex projects such as a twisted tower and how multidisciplinary tools can be used to enhance that workflow. In this first section, as I said, we're gonna, we're gonna start small. What I'd like to do is we'll start with how we go about building data into the BIM as we go. Uh, you'll see us use a lot of different tools to do that and we'll try and guide you through that. How can we use artificial intelligence to direct, direct model detail within the BIM? is another question that we'll provide answers to. And how can the design be modeled quickly? One thing I should also mention is that there, tomorrow afternoon, there is an in-depth session as well that will go into more greater detail for the, for the workflows that we'll be showing you during this session. And one thing to, to note also is that what we're showing for this model, and that's bigger than life, is actually a real project. Um, so it's something that I'm told is finishing construction right now, but uh, just to give you some perspective. Let's get started from a blank screen. We'll activate Quick Draw, which as you'll see will forever change how you go about approaching BIM. With a few inputs, not only has Jacob created a slab, but also a slab in four walls. Quick Draw remains active. And so by highlighting a side or an edge on that space, we can add a dimension and change that from a single space to an L-shaped space. Check. How can we end up adding, using BIMDRAW to, in, how should we think about using BIMDRAW? Yeah. Well, this mic doesn't work. <laughs> now it works. OK, thanks. Um, so these final years, the last two or three years, we really started to look in how we can speed up the process of prototyping. This is very important since if you're designing something, especially conceptual design, you're still thinking through alternatives. So you want to have the tools to quickly have the main contours of your design up there that you can look at some variants, can you try something out. You, in other words, you want to uh, think through your designing. It's, it's the way that people have done it for centuries with pencil and paper. Um, and now we're trying to bring this quick, quick prototyping into a full CAD product. So if you think about prototyping buildings, what you want to get there as fast as possible are the main volumes. You don't want to bother too much about creating all the individual walls, slabs. Um, you just want to have like the main volume of your building there, the main volume of your rooms, so that you have like a quick visual control on how, you, how your overall building is going to look. So can we say that with Quick Draw, Jacob is playing the game of design? Yeah. Well, this is an inside joke because actually, um, when we started looking to create such a building tool, um, we actually drew some inspiration from a, a game that a few of us used to play when we were teenagers, um, where you could very easily build kind of a, a building. But of course, this was just some initial inspiration how you can quickly draw rooms. Um, we had to bring this ID and this interface to a, a real CAD product with all the complexities of uh, continuous dimensions, dynamic dimensions, um, creating the correct uh, connections between your walls, T connections, miters, and so on. It is a mindset changer when you think about how you can not only create spaces with it, but you can edit them in different ways to create more refined and detailed designs pretty quickly. Uh, you're, it's also complemented by other tools such as BIMDRAG that allow you to quickly build on top of what you're doing with QuickDraw to explore design alternatives in a, in a, more, in a quicker way. One thing to also point your attention to is the size of the workspace that Jacob is working with. 
Um, he's mainly using the approach of using the quad, and he's got a toolbar across the top. But he has a lot of area to do modeling on. He could have the ribbon displayed. He could also have a number of toolbars, but this maximizes what he can do with the workspace. Also, one thing to know is that you'll see icons on the right side. Here you can access the properties panel, profiles, components, and on the right, on the left side, you'll see that he has icons that allow him to access the new project browser as well as the structure browser. So it puts a lot at his fingertips, and if you want to adjust and reconfigure that, you're able to as well. One thing to note, you may have already noticed this, is that when Jacob is moving things around, you'll see a ruler appear. What this is allowing him to do is set a distance or understand what distance he's moving that object within the model. And so rather than having to select a snap point or select a random point and then, and then make another move to, to get it where you want, you're able to move it around on the scale with the ruler and have a better understanding, which allows you to model more quickly. You'll also see us use commands that you may have seen before, such as connect. You're, you're all familiar with how walls can be connected, and last year we showed how structural members can be connected. Um, shortly, we'll, we'll show a new way that Connect can be used on MEP as well. There are multiple things that you can do at once when you start modeling with a tool such as this. By extending the wall, what we're, a what we're actually doing is also splitting the slab into two separate members as well and we can separate those and then we can start to quickly work with them independently and use tools such as bin drag to change the height of them and reposition them for something that we'll do a bit down the road when we start uh, showing how propagate works. One of the things that you'll notice with this is that as you're able to use these tools such as quick draw, such as a range of others that you're able to model more quickly, then the modeling tool ends up becoming part of the creative palette. You're able to not be limited by, or think about the limitations of what the tool you're working with is. It can help you start to shape the ideas and explore ideas in <coughs> new and different ways. And it allows you to take your ideas farther, further, and faster. So we're starting to get a basic form in place, and we can add a roof to initially put cl a, a closure on top of this, uh, on top of the first floor. Now, as we looked at the, as, as we consider the exterior, we kind of need something to make it a bit more interesting, so we can start to explore a design idea. The design idea may come from pulling on a boundary to creating uh, a solid that then we have another face that we can drag across. It could be something as simple as offsetting an edge that creates another boundary that allows us to uh, extend a portion of the wall that maybe starts to trigger a thought about an idea. And maybe with that, we're, seeing, we're starting to see something that might be interesting to carry to the other side of the building. So we, can use, we could select it and, and again, Jacob's showing the ruler. <laughs> So we could select that and then we can use a tool called the manipulator, which you've seen before, that would allow us to quickly make a mirrored copy and include, it, include that copy of that solid on the other side. But what you can start to think about is how you can use and mold these and shape these solids such as clay. Um, so you're able to do a number of different things just reinforcing how powerful the manipulator is. But you can view these solids as clay. Um, you can, again, you can decide whether you want to look at a surface or look at or create boundaries. The idea of, of maybe once you start to do this, you're starting to see that band across the top. And so the concept of a flowing band or flowing border around the design might be something interesting to pursue. So you're quickly able to adjust those solids and shape them in ways that allow you to explore that rather than having to spend a lot of time modeling it to get there. And maybe we decide to carry that band down to the, lower, to the base level so that we're starting to see it wrap upwards across the first level and to the roof as well. We could also add a little flair to it with using the manipulator in another way 
to where we can set, we can rotate that face and create the leg there. Now that we've started this idea of the flowing border, flowing band across two sides, let's bring them together across the front. Again, you're seeing us use a common set of tools to get there. And once you start utilizing those tools, you'll find you're modeling with a rhythm that allows you to uh, do some very interesting things. If we look at this and say that maybe we want to play with that roof plane a little bit, uh, we can highlight the surfaces of the roof that we want to move. We can also select the bottom and top surfaces of that band. And we can use our friend the manipulator again. And one thing to note is that you also have predefined selection options on the manipulator, or you can set the angle that you want directly. So now we've got our walls didn't come with that move, but we can easily connect them to it by just selecting aligned surfaces and then attaching them to the roof. So very quickly, we're starting to bring this design together. One of the other things we can do is to align with the band that's on the front of the parapet, we can select that point as a reference point, carry it back to the wall, and then draw a rectangle to create a void. This allows us to start to further develop that idea of the flowing band on this side. And then, of course, we'll need to carry it all the way around, so we want to bring a solid into play there, that we can simply start to push and pull to further develop the idea of, of this flowing band. So now you're seeing it starting to carry across all parts of the upper, of the first level. Sorry, I keep wanting to say second floor. <laughs> And based on where we selected that start point for how we started to create the void, now when we bring this wall forward, it's aligned with that parapet. So you can use precision where you want to. You can model quickly in other areas that you want to. And then we can complete this idea by carrying this leg down to the base level. And then again, using the manipulator to change the orientation of it. And in this case, we'll shift the whole angle of it outward a bit. But as you can see, the manipulator can be used in a number of different ways. So now we have this idea of this flowing band that starts at the ground level, goes up around the first level, and all the way up to the roof. We can add more context to this as well pretty quickly by adding a site. We'll, we'll just put a site plane in there for reference currently. Since we've got this design in place and we've been adding more detail to it, we can start exploring how we can start to incorporate glazing into it as well. The original design has a pool in this area that's created to the left of this long wall. So one of the things that might be interesting is to put a glass panel wall in along that, along that longer wall plane. We can do that with another new tool called Panelize. And what this allows you to do is you can create a grid you can refine, it gives you a default grid, and you can refine the size of that grid however you want. Once the grid's defined, we can use BIM Create Window that we can select from the quad to quickly create this, pane, this glass pane wall. <coughs> so check, we're starting to add more detail and shape the design of this building. What are other w approaches and ways that we can add further detail to the model? Well, I actually first want to point to the fact that so far we just focused on geometric modeling. Um, we really believe in the philosophy that you have to give architects the tool to quickly get their geometric design out there to like the way they like it without having to bother about classifications or materials or other kinds of BIM data. First, just go for your conceptual design. That's also why we released last year a free modeler, but everything that Jacob has done until now, you can also do in this free modeler shape. Um, of course, we're here in the real BIM product, and now it is really time to get into the adding the BIM data. Because if you let the user first focus on all the geometry, 
you have to give him a little assist afterwards with adding the BIM data, or it would be a very tedious work to manually label all walls, uh, assign all compositions, etc. Um, we started investigating this. Well, the process we call it is BIMifying a model, and um, we try to automate it as much as possible, and we're using there some techniques of artificial intelligence, which we blend with other techniques of um, algorithms. Uh, two years ago, we actually started with first classifying solids, so that if you have just geometry there, that you can know which one are the walls, which one are the slabs, which one are the columns. Uh, last year, we added to the BIMify process that we could also detect where are the buildings, where are the stories. And this year, BIMify has been extended a lot more even. Um, we now can, well, we have improved the classifier. We can also classify block refs now. Um, we improved the classification of HVAC elements, which wasn't that good yet. Um, we al also, if there is structural profiles in your model, just in geometry, for instance, you imported some geometry, we can match them with um, the profile name in our libraries. Um, and, uh, oh, one final thing, we also now detect automatically the rooms. And because we have the rooms, we can also detect where are the external and the internal walls of the building? And this will come in very handy once Jacob will start adding compositions. Great, thanks, Czech. Now let's see BIMify in action. So now that we have all the exterior glazing or the least, at least the initial design ideas there, we can launch BIMify. And what this allows us to do is it has been enhanced as well so that we can, if we want to just do classifications, we can do that. Or as Czech mentioned, we can do sections, elevations, floor plans. And so let's go ahead and keep everything selected. So it moves fast. And everything that we had checked on there is being applied to the model and classifying it and organizing it further. So that when Jacob <laughs> accesses the structure browser, we're able to see that the building is now, all the elements are under the building. They have all floors, their sections. Everything is classified so that now we can start to add additional detail to carry our design further faster. So there are a number of ways that we can do this. Now that we have, now that BIMify has provided such a great starting point, we can select things directly from the structure browser. In this case, we'll select a set of walls. And in this case, it's interior walls. We can activate the components compositions panel, excuse me. And once we isolate the set of compositions that we want to work with, we can drag and drop that directly from the compositions panel into the model. And, and so what you're seeing now is there's icons appear. And the, the green check icons allow you to switch the reference surface of that wall. And so once that's been done, then when you finish the command, those compositions have been applied to that set of walls. We can also do the same for a second set of walls. And in this case, we'll look at some of the exterior walls. <coughs> Again, you can quickly use the same process of dragging and dropping the composition from the compositions panel onto the BIM, or the developing BIM. You still have the same options of selecting the reference surfaces, and then you can apply those to the BIM as well. Now, that's, that's great that you can select those classified components, but well, and I should also say that as you look at it, you can see the compositions come in right away. So you'll see the layers of the compositions the, the moment that you classify those, or the, mo the moment that you apply those to those, those walls. Now, there are other ways that you can use the structure browser to start to define selections. You're now able to, to do queries on the overall BIM so that if we wanted to type a query that allowed us to identify walls of a, of a lower than a certain height, we can input that, and then it creates the selection set. Now we can pick them again from the structure browser, and then we have another group that we can apply compositions to. This may seem sort of redundant for a demonstration, but think about what, what's happening. We're cycling through applying compositions to all the elements very quickly so that we can then take our design and explore our ideas at the next level. We can, do, we can also step into the interior. And show how 
we can complete applying the compositions for a set of things and then how we can start to move forward and look at even higher levels of detail and start playing with that more. So yes, you can apply compositions to sets. You can also just quickly drag and drop them from the compositions panel directly into the BIM so that if you wanted to select a floor or the floors and then also select the roof, you can do that. Now, once we have that level of information present within the BIM, we can select maybe a group of uh, planes that we want to, or a group of components that we want to start editing. We can turn on the compositions. And then similar to the way that you saw Jacob pushing and pulling to create the form for the building, we can also do that with the layers of the compositions. So we can start to redefine or shape this detail in a way that we want. And you have the similar tools with the ruler and other things that you had previously. So check. We're starting to see how we can reshape details, but how has Propagate been expanded to build on this and also be applied to other applications? Well, the Propagate tool has already been anticipated highly this morning. Um, but in fact, Propagate is a full reworking of a tool we released last year. It was then called BIM Suggest. But actually, we fully rewrote it, and it's now a very generic mod uh, detail propagator. It's really mentioned to propagate any detail connected to its environment all through your model. Um, to prove that you can still do what our previous tool can do, we have um, made the connection here with the slab and the wall. But now we can just add even an insulation block. It doesn't matter. You can add extra details to it, and these will be copied and propagated along. So the workflow now actually continues as it did before. So Jacob has um, selected this detail, um, which or will select this detail. No, this, here is the detail. This is an extrudable detail. So this means that we can just um, apply this detail everywhere where the same walls and slabs um, connect, and we can on each place, um, change the length to the length that is needed of this detail. Um, so this is just like, this is not that much extra with what we did last year. I said that we really reworked this uh, tool. So now this year, uh, we will show a few other applications of it. Um, and and check, just to yeah. clarify, so that, so Jacob was showing that insulation block that's continuous. So it's, the model is changing all across the length of that, not just at where the section is cut. Is that yes, correct? Yes, indeed. This detail was uh, found on a section between the walls and the slabs. Therefore, it knows that it can be elongated along the, well, along the length of that wall. So that, therefore, it can adjust its length everywhere in the model to all the lengths of the wall. Um, the next application we will show is adding a um, wall cap to these little railing walls. Um, that's with a, another specialization of this propagation tool where we propagate along an edge. Um, here you just start with um, a small wall cap, just uh, design it from scratch or you import it somewhere. And now you can propagate it all along the edges of uh, these similar surfaces. So again, the detail is found. Now it's uh, shown where it all can be applied. So if there are locations like on this top roof, you don't want this cap, so you can just click it off. Um, now you can apply it. And what is also interesting to note is that also the corners of these details are fixed. So if, because there the wall caps come together, you have to add there a miter. Um, Jacob will now select or uh, show an, another application which involves a window. But before he goes there, or while he goes there, I have to say that tomorrow in the in-depth session, we will show a lot more applications of these tools in other contexts, for instance, also in a more structural model where you can propagate a detailed connection between structural elements to other locations. So at this moment, Jacob has just inserted a window in this roof. Um, this is, if you want to propagate this, this is a detail inside the surface. So typically you want to have more than one copy of this detail in a surface. So we added, if you have this kind of details, kind of a contextual menu, 
where you can just choose how much of these details you want and you just create um, a roof full of windows. Um, ah, so you're not just limited to the original options that are proposed, you can continue to expand that and then start to edit the yeah. overall group. Exactly. What's also interesting uh, or important to note is it, it is not just a copy that we do because each of these roofs is connected to this or each of these windows is connected to the roof in a particular way. So the roof have in each of these locations be sculpted so that these windows suits there perfectly. Oh, that's great. And it, it, it's definitely a lot easier and you can be more creative with it than if you were doing just an array or a series of copies as well. Yeah, indeed. All right, we're starting to, to carry the design further, but let's look at another way that we can start to add detail to it. You saw Jacob earlier dragging a component into uh, on the back side of the, of the building. We can do that also by activating the components panel. You can select doors and or other entities and drag and drop them into the model. You can choose the location and then you've introduced it into your BIM. Now the interesting thing about this component is it's a Revit family and so it's an RFA file. And did I mention that this is a Revit family? An RFA file. So this opens up the opportunity that you have to bring content into your into your BIM. We can also do that in other ways as well. Um, so we can step inside the, the step inside the design as well. If we wanted to add to the components, I should say not only does it have a new look and feel, but it also has a lot more content included and a lot more components. But if you wanted to add your own custom set to it, you can easily do that by adding a path. And then what we'll do is we'll make a selection and introduce a set of freely available IKEA Revit families that we can bring into the component panel. And then once we can select the folder that those are in, and then now we've got that as a part of our palette of what we can use for components, and we can drag and drop them into the, in, into the interior and start to quickly add a bunch of components uh, and start to explore how that influences the interior design of the space. If we want to make some other design changes, um, we're able to do that. So pretty easily you can see how you can start to build up your design in this way as well, adding detail that comes with the components into the overall BIM. So now let's step back to the exterior and go back to that, oh, did I mention it was a Revit family door? <laughs> so let's open that door and take a look at it. So somewhat, somewhat complex model. We can also look at the mechanical browser and and check if it has any parameters or constraints associated with it. Uh, in this case, this one, this one doesn't, so we're, so we're not really able to resize it within the BIM and, and kind of start to manipulate that more. So we'll activate the subtract solid that's associated with that component, and we'll use a tool called parameterize. Now, what we can do with this is that then we can parameterize that Revit family into a parametric component that when we select on the mechanical browser, now you're able to see it has a few parameters and a few constraints associated with it. So then we can start to explore, because one of the challenges with dealing with components, or at least the challenge I've had, is understanding what parameter moves what and to what extent. So um, we can end up selecting a parameter. You can right click and then now you're able to animate the parameters. So you can start to see what that parameter is controlling. Then we could change the name of it if we want to uh, have it to where it's, it's more easily recognizable when we go back to the BIM as well. Uh, you can explore the other parameters in the same way where you can animate them. In this case, we're looking at the bar between the two panes of lower glazing in the door. We can rename that as well. Then we can save our parameterized, our new parameterized Revit family component. And we can go back to the BIM. 
Now we can highlight it and replace it using the quad. And then now when we select, I'm getting ahead of you. <laughs> and now that when we select it, we're able to look at the properties and we'll see that the parameters are there. And we can start to explore, this becomes another part of the design where we can start to look at if we change the width of that door, um, what it ultimately looks like if we want to make it bigger, smaller, and if we want to change any of the other parameters, such as the one we named, which is looking at the height of the, of the panel between, of the member between the glazing. So that's just showing you in quickly ways that you can not only bring other types of content into the BIM, but you can also parameterize it and add more flexibility for what you're doing with the design. So in this section, we showed you how you can quickly go from a blank screen to a design idea concept pretty quickly, how you can add other detail to the, to the BIM, and how you can use AI through propagate and other approaches to uh, carry the design farther, further, faster. So in this next section, we're gonna step to medium, where we're going to look at design documentation for an adaptive reuse building that's obviously a medium size. To join me in this section, I'll invite Tiemann up to the stage. Tiemann is the BIM product development manager <laughs> at BrickSCAD. <laughs> and one of the things that, uh, well, let me just say that 2D deliverables are, are very, very important to the design process. It's the critical way that deliverables, or it's the main deliverable that's being developed at different design stages. So it puts importance on how the 2D documentation is not only created, but how it's maintained over the process. Tiemann, how, what, what an enhanced functionality is included in version 19 that's targeted towards design documentation? Yeah, thank you. So in um, V19, we have expanded uh, the tool set for generating uh, 2D deliverables automatically from the 3D model um, in different ways. Um, so now in V19, it's possible to automatically generate uh, reflected ceiling plans uh, from your 3D model. It's also possible uh, to generate uh, schedules automatically, which are tables with uh, quantity takeoffs. And it's also, uh, we have improved uh, functionalities to add uh, more information uh, to your 2D documents, like um, tags and also classification codes. Uh, so, and we will show these new features in the, in the next part of this uh, BIM demo. Great, thank you, Damon. And also, uh, want to say that the, the main components of this design documentation workflow, in the BIM, we've got the visuals, we've got the data that's being developed as we develop the model, that's ultimately being collected and organized by a friend you'll get to meet shortly, the project browser. And then that is helping organize and set up and, and lay out these sheet sets that ultimately is where what shape the deliverables for the different milestones of a project. So some of the questions that we're going to explore in this section are, how can we work with schedules? How can we bring them into sheets? How can we edit them? How can we start to manipulate them? and see how best to incorporate them into the, into the sheet set. How can we work with grids? Um, how are they being automatically, data being automatically incorporated into the, into, into the views that we create from the sections, whether they be sections, elevations? Um, how can we use the project browser? Um, how can it become our, our best friend? You know, the type of friend that helps you get organized, that talks you out of having that fourth last one before the end of the evening. Um, and how can we add detail to sheet, how can we manage the detail on the sheets once we've created them? So the project that we're gonna work on during the medium section is the Gemini building. It's a proposed retrofit design uh, for an office building that has, it's multi-story and then it's got a large canopy structure that's associated with it at the ground level as well. Ultimately, we're looking at how we can tell the story with the design documentation, and there are a number of ways that you can do that within the BIM, but um, Tiemann, what's the best way that we can start to use the project browser to do that? Yeah, so, um, or actually, I'll hold off on asking you that. 
Sorry, Jacob, go ahead. <laughs> Right, so this is the 3D model of uh, the Gemini building project. Um, so Jacob will now use uh, the project browser to navigate us through the design documentation set of this uh, project uh, that was uh, generated automatically. Um, so the way we see a BIM is not just as a 3D model, but it also includes a lot of different integrated data sets. Uh, for example, um, floor plans, elevations, sections, uh, but also um, schedules. And luckily, a lot of these uh, 2D deliverables are generated automatically from the 3D model, and they are kept in sync as, as much as possible. Um, but still, I think it's important that the user needs a way to manage and navigate all these 2D deliverables. And this is exactly what the project browser was designed for, uh, because it brings together all the parts of your BIM project. So it shows you a logical hierarchy of all the uh, sections, uh, schedules, sheets and also all the extra models that are in your uh, that are in your project um, so and in this way it gives the user the experience that he's working in, um, in in a BIM project rather than a collection of individual drawings um, and Jacob will now continue to use this uh, project browser uh, to navigate us uh, through the design documentation set thanks team <laughs> There's so much information that goes into the BIM, the, the, the organization of it and management of it is key. Yes, and it's also, of course, about the accuracy of uh, the drawings. Uh, if you have a look at the level of detail in these kind of automatically generated drawings, um, it would just be a lot of work to, to make this all uh, manually. Great, and one thing to note, as projects get larger and to this medium scale, they, they begin to get more complex and you start to see more XREFs associated with the BIM. One thing that the project browser allows you to do is it provides a list of all the XREFs that are part of, of, of the model. So you can go to it and then just select, when you focus on the model section, these are all of the XREFs that are associated with that larger project model. We can select the third floor and if you're Paying attention, you won't see the uh, document tabs on the upper left of the workspace. This gives you an option. Don't worry, they, you don't need them. But if you want to work this way, the project browser provides the option of just being able to select the XREFs, uh, and so you can access them directly from the project browser that way. So now that we have this third floor, let's say we want to look at doing schedules for it and quantity takeoffs. So we can start, we can set up a sheet, and in this case we'll do a, a, a blank sheet where we're starting to add schedules to it so that we can explore what the size of the schedules are, what kind of information we want to include, uh, how it starts to look, and then we can figure out best how to incorporate them into the overall uh, design documentation. So we can, we'll start by looking at an equipment and furniture schedule. We can display the schedules. And so we have two, Two schedules with a bit of information here. Uh, the schedules aren't static. What we can do is we can look at different column parameters. We can select and change that. Uh, we can look at um, adding formulas to this. We can do custom design fields. We can also add classification codes uh, to it as well. So once you have these schedules in place, you can also start to add other elements to this. So Jacob's going to start adding some some furniture to the design. Tiemann, with, while he's doing this, can you explain a bit more about how classification codes can be used as an organizer in the BIM? Um, so classification codes are um, really important in a building information model because they help you to organize um, your BIM. So classification codes are typically defined on a national level or for a certain domain, or they can be related to the work breakdown structure of your, um, of your company. Um, so Omniclass, which is used in this example, is just one example of a classification code system. But of course, other systems can be used, and even multiple systems can be used uh, in parallel, uh, so at the same time. Um, and all, these, all this data, all these properties, are of course also available in the 2D deliverables. Uh, so they can be used in, in schedules, they can be used in the tags on the, on the floor plans and the sections, and they can also be exchanged uh, through IFC. Ah, yeah, and the classification codes become important also if you're looking at something such as cost estimating in ways that you can start to start to do that within the BIM. 
Great, so we can go back to that sheet and we can see that once Jacob updates the schedule, that the furniture that's been added, as well as the property information about um, the article number and the classification codes have been incorporated into the schedule as well. So we can look at, let's add one more schedule and explore that a bit. We'll add a, we'll add a window schedule to this sheet. And as we zoom in and look at this a bit, it's got some, got a, different information about it, about the windows, but it doesn't have a unique identifier for any of the, for any of the windows in particular. Luckily, there's a command for that. Um, so we can go back to the BIM and the ability to provide a, a unique identifier for this, we can access the windows through the structural browser. So we can select the set on the third floor and then we can run number from the quad. This allows you to also put a prefix, suffix. Uh, if you want to add letters to the unique identifiers, you're able to do that. And so then it processes through the whole set of windows applying, applying those unique identifiers. And then when we go back to the schedule and we update it, we can see that unique identifier is added to the schedule overall. So if you make changes to the BIM, and, and the schedule will stay linked to that as well. So now if we jump to another sheet, so this sheet we've got what is a floor plan down below, and then we have a reflected ceiling plan up above. So the reflected ceiling plan is that obviously if you cut a section, you set a mirror on it and look up, I mean, or look down, you see what's up, and um, you're able to then start to explore and quantify what the lighting design is, what the ceiling planes are, as well as uh, structural members or, or beams that are exposed as well. One thing I should say also is this design is at a stage where you're not seeing a lot of notes and other things. What we're trying to convey is as you develop these sections, what information is being automa automatically included with those, with those sections. So one way that you can add detail to the viewports pretty quickly is if you use the tags feature. And by selecting that viewport, then we're able to quickly add tags for a number of different components. And, and this set has been expanded as well. So we've obviously got the room tags there. You also have tags on the columns that allow you to see what the profile is. Wall types. And then we're able to also have tags such as for stairs that show the number of risers and the height between those risers as well. So just an example of a way that you can start to add detail to it quickly. Now, at different project phases, you might find that you need to, you need to be able to transfer information to a consultant, to a owner for the overall BIM. Typically, what approach you'll use for that is the industry foundation class approach where you can capture the overall model uh, with the schedules and the classification codes as well. Timon, what are some of the ways that um, IFC and open BIM workflows are being utilized? So um, Brixis is an active member of Building Smart International and we support several uh, open BIM uh, workflows. Um, so open BIM means in fact that anyone who is involved in the design pro project can participate uh, through the use of open standards like, uh, for example, industry foundation classes or IFC. Um, IFC is, is not new, but it's a continuous effort uh, to improve and, and introduce new uh, open BIM workflows uh, through the use of this uh, IFC schema. For, exa for example, in, in V19 it's now possible to export um, uh, big models with XREFs, uh, like in this case, uh, to a single IFC file or to a set of separate um, IFC files. And of course, also in the future, we, we will continue to introduce uh, new open BIM workflows. Um, for example, uh, the introduction of the new IFC 4 schema and also BIM collaboration format or BCF. Great, it's great to hear the the continued focus and expanding the focus on open BIM workflows and how that data can be transferred and the transparency of it as well. 
So in this section, we quickly showed you some of the enhancements that are around design documentation for a medium-sized <coughs> building. We showed you how you can add associative tags. We showed you how you can do a range of things with the project browser, your new best friend, uh, to be able to bring that information together and start to shape the design documentation initially and manage it as you carry forward. Thank you, Timon. So now let's carry to the third section that looks at large. And large in this case is looking at a, a large tower that we'd like to refer to as the twisted tower. Um, it's, it's one that adds a, a level of complexity to the approach and um, how you can go about what tools can you use to handle to handle something like that as well as start to incorporate multidisciplinary design into it as well. I'd like to call Peter, who is also a product development manager, BIM product development manager for Bricks CAD BIM. Oh, welcome, Peter. Peter. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> um, some of the questions that we're going to explore during this section are, as I mentioned, how we can manage and work with a large, complex project the role of multidisciplines. How can we start to investigate the facade design? Um, how can we start to work and incorporate with the site? And how can we also look at the MEP layout initially? And how, how does this allow us to explore, not only explore things with the design, but start to identify issues earlier and how we can start to begin to address those? And ultimately, this is an image of the Twisted Tower and some of the elements that we'll, that we'll show you shortly. We're not going to be able to show you every step by step, which we tend to like to do, but every step of how we created this form. Uh, so I want to show you a quick video that summarizes what we've done and how you, could, how you could start in shape and carry that forward into create the BIM for the Twisted Tower. So rather than building the form from from the ground up, what we're doing is looking, we, we explored ways to do this and we looked at how we could create the overall and then start to, start to break it down into the form that we wanted. Once we had these three elements, then we could start to twist it and explore what form made sense, what rotation made sense. Then we could quickly use multi-slice to be able to split that into the number of different floors that we were working with, and also a command blockify that identifies common patterns of, of, in this case, floor plates, that then we could focus on one, we could isolate it, and then we could look at shelling it, basically just looking at ways that we could turn that solid into walls and, and other surfaces. And then once we did that, we were able to start to look at how we could apply um, ideas for glazing to it. And then we could apply that to all of the typical floors within that set. And this just gives you a feel for what it, you would obviously carry this design further, but to finish the other floors and the other block, blockified blocks that have been identified. But it quickly gives you uh, an idea about how you can go from that, from that first idea to start to develop the BIM. So now we're in the overall twisted tower. So obviously with this type of, with this scale of project, you're going to have um, numerous XREFs that are part of it because you'll have team members that are working on different parts. Uh, and in, in one of the cases, the floor is used more than 20 to 25 times. So what we can do is start to isolate, we can isolate that floor, opening it from the quad. And then here we have just an initial representation of that, of that floor plate layout. We can start to create a radial grid. Peter, with the way that grids have been incorporated into Bricks CAD BIM version 19, what are some of the ways that we can use that? When you think of it, 
grids can be useful in many different areas. So we've seen Jacob create a grid on a vertical face of a wall to make a window. Later on, we'll see him creating grids on curved surfaces to make a curtain wall again. And here we see uh, a radial uh, building grid. As you've seen, there's no dialog box. There's no grid editor wizard or anything. Because just like we allow any wall, any solid to be a wall, we also allow any curve to be a grid axis. And then the grid is just a block of uh, grid axis. And then you can rev edit that block and use any of the standard 2D tools to shape your grid in any way you want it. It's definitely not limited to a couple of choices in a combo box. That's great. So we're able to get a, a fairly complex grid in place pretty quickly. Now that we have this grid, let's look at how we can add the, add the column design, which is composed of multiple profiles and also a column base that's embedded into the, into the slab. In this case, the composition of the slab, the, the base plate will go down a couple layers to meet that to meet that point. So we ultimately need to create a void in the, in, in the slab to represent that base plate. And one of the things to note with the profiles panel is that here we can also make numerous selections if we want. We're obviously doing a structural element, so we'll choose structural steel. We can choose the standards that we want to work, work with directly, and then we can choose the shape. And ultimately what can happen here is that now we can just drag and drop that into the model and then we can locate that profile where we want it and, and create the height that we want for this, for this part of it. Then we can create another, select another profile, drag it in. And now we have our, our column composition. So what we can do now, because we have the grid associated with the project as well, is that we can show how we can use propagate in another way. So we can select the base slab, and then we can select the components related to that column. And then we can explore what options we have to now consider for propagate. So we didn't have to select the grid, but it knows the grid is there. And so since we had the column on the intersection of the grid, across that, that floor plate, or that slab that we selected, which is not a rectangular shape, uh, we're able to see all the column options that are available. And so the ones that have the exclamation point are identifying that there's potential conflict in geometry between that and another element within the design. So we could, as you've seen earlier when we were doing the skylights, we can deselect those pretty quickly. to build the set that we want to have associated with it. And then we can finalize it. And now we've got the layout for the columns, which is much quicker than if we use polar array or if we use copies. Um, it's allowing us to choose where we want. And as with all other uses of propagate, it's carried that detail around, directly modeled it to where it's removed that, that insert from the slab as well. Now, I see that we don't have one of the curtain walls laid out. So first, let's take a look at that wall. Because we're dealing with the twisted tower that twists 1.5 degrees as the building goes up. So as you might expect, this wall is twisted. So how can we apply a curtain wall to this complex, complex wall? Well, we can select the surface, and then we can utilize the curtain wall tool to establish the grid. And again, you can just enter the dimensions that you want. You can also uh, set parameters such as planarization, such as glass thickness, width, and depth for the curtain wall. And then when you complete that process, you've got that curtain wall for that twisted wall in place. So now we can save this typical floor that we've been working on. And we can go back to the overall BIM. And as we look at these floors, there's not, the columns aren't there yet, and the curtain wall hasn't been, isn't, isn't there as, as well either. 
So we can update that XREP. And the powerful thing is that now we're updating that for the 25 floors that are associated with it. So very quickly, we've got the columns in place. And we have the curtain wall there as well. So as we zoom back, you can see an area that obviously we need to do some work on. The, the twisted tower needs a dramatic entry to help deal with the twisted tower form and, and present it in the way that it, that it should be presented. So the way we can do this is by going to, the, to that XREF for that area, which is composed of multiple floors and has a lot of other XREFs already included with it. We've started to lay out the we started to explore the form for what this could be and have curves already in place so that we could look at a lofted surface. But Peter, we, we mentioned that planarization is one of the properties or parameters within the curtain wall tool. How can it be used for this type of complex glazed canopy surface? Well, when we're, when we're creating a gla glazing system on such a surface, we first create a grid the grid is based on the intersection points between the U and the V curves of that surface. And here's where plan and, and the four intersection point of each um, of these uh, curves uh, form a cell and the glass panels will be based on such a cell. And that's when we, um, we have planarization. Uh, the grid is approximated in such a way that each four points of such a cell become coplanar. And when you have coplanar points in such a cell, you can have a planar glass panel with straight linear edges that, are, um, that fit nicely within the frame, which will also be based on uh, simple rectangular extrusions. On the intersection nodes of the panels, you can either choose to have a simple straight connection, or you can make a smooth connection with which will use lofted solids just to improve the visual of, uh, of the display. So if I understand correctly what you're saying with, with planarization, it's, it's a way that it provides a, a simplified way to approach this complex surface for what the glazing system that's created that potentially could be more cost effective than if other approaches were used. Exactly. Great, well it's starting to look very interesting and very dynamic. So one of the other things as we start to bring that back into the overall model and um, as we scale back, there's other things that we want to add. We'll obviously need to update that XREF that then we can start to see what the, the canopy design looks in the larger context of the tower. But as we scale back, we can start to look at some other multidisciplinary tools within this. We, we should probably put this building on a site so that it doesn't float in, 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 in the air, although we were talking about the next generation earlier. So we can use the Create Site tool. We can select Import from File. And we can select a coordinate file that we can bring into, into our BIM. So once this 10 surface is, is incorporated into the project, and the, and the coordinate file can be obviously obtained from a number of different sources. But we can start to change the, change the look and feel of this so that if you wanted to expose contours, change colors, other things, you could do that. Um, but ultimately, what we're going to need to do, because if you look towards the Twisted Tower, it's, it looks like it's sinking a little bit, um, because it has lower floors. Oops. And, um, and so we're going to need to explore ways that we can do grading on this to accommodate those lower levels uh, within the Twisted Tower. So again, this is expressing just that you can change the appearance of that once you start to bring it in. And um, there's obviously other tools that you can, you can utilize within this tool set as well. But so to accommodate for this and to add grading to this, we need to go to the underside of the building. So we'll, we'll, we'll take you underneath. And here we can select the, the bottom of that lowest level, the outline of the bottom of the lowest level. Then when we select the site surface, now we're able to adjust what the grading angle is uh, by moving the cursor around to expand or contract it. And we can also set a specific uh, dimension for that grading as well. And what we'll do is select the grading and we'll turn the boundary on. And 
when we do this, you'll get feedback on some of the, some of the, types of, uh, the type of data that you can start to, to learn about as you're doing this. So we now have a, a net volume, and what that's calculated is the amount of soil that would need to be removed from that grading to accommodate those lower levels uh, during construction. And since we turned the boundary on, we can go back to the top and we can start to see how the, the extent of what that grading is influencing. So obviously that, that would be excavated first and then as construction moved forward, it would be backfilled in. Now let's also look at an, another example of adding a parking area to this layout so that it's going from the uh, entry area that we just developed with the glazed canopy and going to a, an overall parking area. So similar approach, we can, we can select the boundary for that, and then we can select grading again, and have the op option of picking the surface within the model. And then we can start to explore the grading angle of that in the same way and set the dimension that we ultimately want or the angle we ultimately want. And so here we have another uh, graded area that's been defined. Uh, to, to clean things up, we can turn the boundary of this on. And again, we have a volume for what the quantity of soil would need to be to build up to that, to have the, the, the base of the tower as well as the parking area as well. So one thing to note, we're also dealing with multiple angles and slopes here, so that the parking area is down below where the main entry is and, and and the ramp is going down. So it's just to express that you can, you can handle and work with this in a number of different ways. And as I mentioned, there are other, a lot of other tools that you can expand on and utilize to uh, create and work with sites. So now we've started to add to the context of what we have, but we should probably start to consider the systems, and the systems of the tower in a bit more depth. So now we can go to the 37th floor, and here we can access the current XREF for the MEP layout. And what this is showing is the ceiling layout for this 37th floor as well as a air supply air distribution system that's tying to chilled beams. In this case, part of it's laid out on the perimeter areas. Um, the twisted tower has a circular core that doesn't twist, so it allows the services to go vertically in the building. But we'll, we'll start by creating a, a, duct, a main duct and a duct branch, uh, and we'll focus on the central space. So we can do this similar to how we started to create the, the, the profiles for the column. We can drag profiles in. We can just use the starting point, and then we can set the height for the first piece of that main duct. Oh, uh, you can also rotate them if you want to change the orientation of them. So we'll do a multi-segment branch of this. Obviously, this would be tied back to the vertical, the main vertical, depending on how other things were laid out. But once you complete that, then you're able to see just the connection that's happened with those ducts. So you're not having to do it. It's already, it's already in place. Another thing that you can do is then you can start to connect it with uh, the existing ducts that have been laid out. So I mentioned that you'll see connect again. This is now the point when you see it, where you can select the two ducts and then you're able to connect it to that main branch. Now let's focus on how we can connect it to the chilled beams. So each of these chilled beams has a flow connection point associated with it. What that allows you to do is, is assign a profile to that component so that if we select create linear solid, then if we select that flow connection point, the profile that we start with is what's been specified with the component. Um, so if you receive components from, from other team members that you're working with that already have that defined, you can bring them in the model and start doing that right away. So once we have that flow segment in place, we can select it and then just simply connect it to the main branch duct. And you can also hit control to, to explore different options for that connection. So now that's just a few steps, pretty easy, but there's also an easier way that we can go about it. <coughs> so we could select all the rest of the uh, chilled beams, 
and then select connect and connect it to that main branch duct. And so very quickly we have um, those nine other ones, eight if I could actually count right, um, connected to that main branch duct, even the end one that was past the end of the duct. So it's just to express that quickly we can start to lay this out and get a feel for the role it's playing in the design and then, and then we could start to look at uh, how it, if there's any conflicts or anything with the current structural layout. So in this case, we could turn on the structural XREF or bring it into this DWG. And then we can start to zoom in and take a look at potential conflicts. And yes, the duct is too high and is in, is in conflict with the ring beam, which is obviously a pretty important design element in the overall twisted tower. So we need to explore how we can start to change that. So one way we could do it is by selecting that main duct and then splitting it into multiple sections. <coughs> so we can do that, and then once we have that in place, then we could select one of the surfaces of that main duct branch. And then we can use BIM drag and we could start to move that duct around to see what makes sense. Now, Jacob's being a little bit ambitious and trying to go above the beam, which might pose a few more other, other issues. So we'll then start to bring it down to a height below the beam. And again, you're getting feedback with the, um, with the ruler and the scale as well. And then we could zoom in and check if we've been successful in creating some clearance there, which we have. But one thing to also notice is that the connections with the chilled beams went with it. Um, we didn't have to go back and make that change to the duct height and then touch each of the connections with the chilled beams. We were able to do that in one move. Peter, what are some other ways that these multidisciplinary tools have benefits and, and in the overall picture of, of a project such as this? Well, I think one of the most important things is, uh, as been mentioned before, visual control. So by having uh, these MEP modeling tools, you can quickly lay out a ventilation system in this building without actually being a ventilation specialist. And that allows you to, in a very early stage, see these problems and explore ways to fix them. Same thing goes for the other um, disciplines like the facade design. It allows you to very quickly explore how, what an impact a different um, glazing system will have on, on the visual side and also on the cost, as well as for the side modeling, when you know exactly how many uh, cubic meters will need to be excavated, you can have a very pr early idea about the cost. Great, thank you, Peter. So in these three sections, we've shown you how you can go, how, BricsCAD 19, version 19, enables you on small, medium, and large projects to be able to incorporate these interesting new workflows and exciting new workflows. You've seen how we can go from a blank screen to a concept design in a very short time, how we can add data to it, how we can uh, then start to utilize Propagate to add additional detail and to the overall BIM by direct modeling. We've also seen how we can uh, how design documentation can be developed and how the, your, your new best friend forever, the responsible project browser, can help you with design documentation, managing it throughout the process. We've seen how grids can start to play a role, not only just on, on floor plans, but also on vertical surfaces, and how curtain wall can be used for curtain walls, complex curtain walls, glazed canopy surfaces as well. And you've seen how visual control can play a role in multidisciplinary tools and enhance what you're able to do with BricsCAD BIM. And also to drive the point that Don brought up earlier, we're able to stay in, start in 3D and stay in 3D. You have high fidelity through artificial intelligence. Again, we can focus on visual control and what that enables and that you're able to go faster to design documentation. 
So you're able to add a twist to your design with Bricks CAD BIM version 19. Thank you, and thank you, Peter. Thank you.